KTN News. Get the whole story. In your places, then you are taken to the basement of Nyayo House. Nyayo House would be put naked in a, a, a water uh, in a, a water clogged cell. Agitation for political pluralism in Kenya gained momentum in the late 80s, ultimately hitting the crescendo in early 90s, whose crowning moment came in December 1991 when ruling party Kanu repealed Section 2A of the defunct Independence Constitution, opening wide doors for multi-party politics in Kenya. Efforts that were achieved as a result of years of a bruising second liberation struggle in the trenches that was spearheaded by fearless individuals who championed two underground movements, the December 12th movement that ran a publication called Pambana and then a more politically potent one, Mwakenya, whose full meaning in Kiswahili was Mungano wa Wazalendo wa Kukomboa Kenya or the Patriotic Union of Nationalists to liberate Kenya. Meet three members of the larger faceless underground movement, Professor Isaiah Ngodho Kariuki, Professor Maina Kyongo, and Joseph Kamonye Manje, who still remain tight-lipped on whose brainchild it was, insisting it was team effort. From the University of Nairobi, a group of scholars used to meet do discussions in the Taifa Hall and then um, slowly crystallized to a movement. But Mwakenya was preceded by another movement which was the December 12 movement, which uh, after the people like Maina Kenyatta were arrested, went underground and evolved as Mwakenya let alone. To pinpoint directly who or where is a difficult thing. One thing you must understand, it was an underground movement. The giant underground movement that gave government sleepless nights had university lecturers as masterminds, as Professor Ngodo Kariuki discloses. There were people like Professor Ngogi Wadiongo, who was head of the um, literature department. There were people like Kamoja Washila, who was lecturing in uh, Kenyatta University, Maina Kenyatta, also at the university, Alamini Mazurui, who was also teaching at the university. Uh, there were people like William Mutunga, who was in the law, and who was also arrested and detained in 1988 uh, eight something. Ari, 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 eight, yeah. So there were many of us, you can say progressive forces within the university. Remember there was only University of Nairobi then, and then there was the Kenyatta University College which came later. According to the trio, the sprouting and the spread of the underground movement December 12, which morphed into Mwakenya later on, came about as a result of concerns that struggles of the Mau Mau had been sidestepped or betrayed by those who took over reins of power after independence, resulting into an agitation by people who considered themselves progressives and called for recognition of Mau Mau freedom fighters and their rehabilitation. The assassination of firebrand lawmaker J.M. Kariuki in March 1975 marked the turning point as Professor Maina Kyongo, whose father was a Mau Mau fighter, narrates. When we came back, three months we said, no, we cannot continue like this. When things went, went so badly, people started, you know, at a ground movement. And so we started recruiting people. We started forming. Each one of us, we agreed we have, it's going to form a cell. In terms of politics, the questions were being asked in the platform, but it was realized that you cannot do very much when you are talking above the ground. That is where uh, I, this started from the University of Nairobi. You were dealing with the people who, had, who are scholars, who had studied other movements, 
movements in Cuba, Che Guevara, uh, Walter Rodney, who was at the University of Dar es Salaam, and all these had been people who were now influencing the discussions. The underground movement remained faceless, but it had its tentacles spread all over the country. It had groups of university dons, lecturers in tertiary institutions, civil servants, and school teachers. At the university, architects crafted a strategy to get hold of the deanships. There were only nine deans in the University of Nairobi then. And those progressive forces were fighting to control the deanships. So, Faculty of Arts, we fought Michel Emovo became the dean. Comas, I became the dean. Otieno became the dean of engineering. Okozi became the dean of law. Uh, so there was a struggle also in among, we were also, we were young. So between the young and the old, and the progressive and conformists. So that is how, in terms of campaigning for those posts, we were doing it as a team. Mwakenya movement whose spokesperson was Professor Ngugi Wathiongo was an offshoot of the December 12th movement, DTM, that was crushed after the August 1st, 1982 attempted coup in Kenya. It had its roots in Kenyatta University with Maina Kinyati as the face, but after its scuttling, the University of Nairobi wing assembled a new outfit, the Mwakenya movement, in the months of June and July 1985, which had a bigger membership and which also posed a huge challenge. You know, when you have a bigger movement like that underground, they are, they are dangerous. Now a new leadership was elected. Sooner, sooner than later, there was a problem. You have brought different people. People, they are, there are some who want to take off immediately. We have to do something. Now, nah, they are burning. We have to do something. Others are saying, no, 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 most, most. The ground is not yet ripe. This is a debate now. Within the, the leadership, they came, there was a split. The people agitating for quick action held the upper hand. Now things started moving. <laughs> and uh, people, we have to do something. We are starting mobilizing for, for action. Now mobilizing for action. Some of us urged caution. But the voice of reason was, <laughs> I was defeated by the those who wanted quick action. And uh, it was decided, before we go on, we have to, anybody who comes to now has to take a new commitment. A new commitment, that means taking an oath. And so it was organized. And uh, the one was what to be administered in the two places. The Thogori, Tatari Thogori and Oagige. It was being taken at night. But somehow things, things started to go wrong. The, the rush brought in people who should not have been brought into the movement. And so the government came to get to know there was something going on. Underground became open when it was announced by the Moy system and people were arrested. And even then, even in the interrogations, one only talked of where he knew. You knew only four or five people, you could not go beyond that. And the reason was that uh, the organization had to protect itself. If you are arrested, you are arrested alone. If you break down, you can only break down. With the, uh, you talk about the five people you know. We would have set days, you know, when we would sit down, discuss, and uh, arrange, organize activities for the cell. 
and uh, we had the bulletins you know the magazines that uh, we published uh, what of course came later on to be called Mwa Kenya. A single Mwa Kenya cell would have between three to five members, but the think tanks would insist on odd numbers. Waroiro Mongai, who was a civil servant working at the Kenya Institute of Administration under the office of the president, was the link between a cell and a central committee. <laughs> na wakati mambo yanakuwa mabaya tunatumia uh, watatu the thinking was that uh, you belonged to one cell here with your four other people then you went and developed another cell with another three four five people and then those each one of them went and developed a cell so it is spread but even in spreading you would not know more than you are required to know. One of the uh, uh, statements is to know on the need be basis. Don't know beyond, so that if you are by any chance arrested, you cannot give more than you know. Mwakenya's central committee remained faceless, and over 35 years later, the members still not ready to discuss its membership and associates. Now the central committee mumsana kujua. Manake watu kuna watu wanakuja. Wanata wana advice ni ni the central committee wenyewe. The lethal underground movement would disseminate targeted message to the public in a move to rally the country against the government of the day. We you to target mainly public holidays. And uh, we would produce those papers that would be disputed all over the place. And what we did, we zoned out the areas with the heavy population where we could operate. Nairobi was one of them. We would type it, you know, print, you know, cycle style the copies and uh, then distribute you know and uh, the distribution would be taken uh, would be done in one night all over the country and you are operating underground you are very careful when you when when you mobilize people to go and distribute those papers and you are also doing it you are supervising them i tell you by the following morning the country would be afraid i was also in charge of central i would live here at around six, I go to a petrol. There is a place where I used to to take my fuel on credit, where I fuel my car. I'm not asking anybody for his money. We were using our own money. Fill the car. I have the documents hidden under this the, the car. And I started the journey. I tie my the safety belt. I would do that. And I tell God, I'm not going to do this for myself. I'm doing it for your people. Take care of me. Distribution of the leaflets was probably the most risky. And I remember uh, just to say, uh, you know, a day, an event, you know, uh, an occasion where I escaped um, uh, narrowly, I would say when we were we had printed uh, the pamphlets outside nairobi and we transported it back we were transporting it back to nairobi so we had a whole sack of leaflets and when transporting it we encountered a police roadblock on thicker road but what we had done is that in the sack, we had put at the bottom of the sack some potatoes. In the middle, we put the leaflets and again on top, we put some other potatoes. So when we were stopped by the police, uh, we were obviously uh, a bit lost in terms of how we would uh, go about it. 
uh, we opened the boot, they checked and saw a bag and uh, flagged us off. And probably that is the, uh, the narrowest uh, <laughs> escape I had. And that was, was of course, um, uh, before, long before the arrest. Kangede Mungai, who was a member of the movement alongside his elder brother Waroiro, says there were two sets of publications. Patanishi, which was uh, for the education of our cadres, that was an internal publication for ourselves. Eh? And then there was Pabana for the general public. Yes. So in Patanishi, we had uh, told, in, in, given instru in, instructions eh, to the members, in the case you are arrested, do not show defiance. Do not refuse to speak to these people. Keep talking. Keep talking to them. Tell them anything that you think is, uh, is, 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 is harmless. Eh? So that they, they see you as somebody who is, uh, you know, cooperating. Because if you go there and you defy, you, you refuse to talk, they will think that the way to make you talk is to torture you. The movement had several printing bases for its publications and locations would be shifted from time to time. One of the locations was at the home of the Mungai brothers in Kibishiku, Lower Kabete, between Muimuto and Wangige, besides others in Nairobi's central business district. We had our base in uh, Union Africa House. Brother had a farm there. Uh, we had a machine there, you know, printing it as a money, you know, cycle style. <laughs> so you print that thing, you print. You print the papers. The leader of the printing was a person called Wariru Mungai, who is my elder brother, eldest brother. And he's one who was uh, knowing uh, where the um, stencils are coming from, where the machine will come from. He's one who was organizing that. Eh? And I still remember Chitechi. Chitechi. Chitechi used to, to, to live here in our compound. Chitechi, there was another guy called uh, Kenyua, and there was Peter Yankihara. We we'll do it actually uh, like uh, this time, like in the other two, not a risa, a cash, a cash. Kunawalewa, and a kuja, in fact, is the cause in a kuju hapa. Kunamutu and by nai, I was kuja hapa, last moon perke. Me, I and uh, <laughs> I mean, Kibera Irkwayangu, especially Wakati Nikopegangu. I could not cut it to Kwatu Wakatu Wavidi. The structure remains under lock and key, and even on this day it could not be opened because of what was said a missing key, unsure whether it was by default or by design since a lot of information about the movement still remains closely guarded. Raira alisema hii, hata kama ni wakati huo angekuwa dani, eh, hapa angekuwa nini? Structure anini? Kwa monument. Monument. I'm a monument. Yes. Yeah, that's what he said. Mm -hmm. And he was very clear. Meanwhile, the government continued burning the midnight oil on how to vanquish the underground movement that was like an enormous octopus whose tentacles were nearly in all corners of the country. The movement was operating underground like a mall, but its effects were shaking the foundations of the country as agitation for multi-party democracy hit fever pitch until a domestic crowd of one member blew the cover. I didn't know the government had got any weed. I was on the radar. Something strange happened. Uh, from my own front, domestic. I used to have problems with my wife. The marriage had 
needed to a point of breaking it down. And uh, she was prepared to do anything. What I learned to it alone, I didn't know that time. She went to my study room, got some documents, which were not necessary for the movement. In November 1985, we had lost a very, very close friend, schoolmate, class, classmate. He was even a goddess roommate here. So when to, when we went to bury him, I suggested this man has left very. He, he died very young, the age of 36. He was a headmaster. He was a man so committed to education. I suggested, why don't we set up a fund? We raise money to take care of these children. I was told, why don't you come up with uh, articles and a list? So we started, we compiled a list of about 40 people who would be the initial contributors of the money to the fund. I had that list in my house. So, my wife got hold of that list. She went to the, to the police special branch. She said, I'm a member of a movement that is overthrowing the government. And he had a list of people who are the contributor to the movement. She gave that list. Ah, uh, Kamonya was there. Wait a, wait a number of my friends. Can I tell you, she was asked, are you sure your husband is the leader of this movement? She said, yes. What I was told on is that she wanted to go and meet the president. She approached the presiding bishop, Valley Road. Sit up. That's where I'm, the prayer used to go and play. She said she wanted. She, I was so she said she wanted to see the president. Oh, no, president cannot be seen. You have to tell us why. I have a very very important message. The bishop insisted, and then she said why. The bishop was shocked. Are you sure? Go and think about it. He said, no. Then she was taken with the list. She said, I became the leader of Mwakenya. It was, I was to be hunted down at whatever cost. So even when I went to Kisumu, I was on the government ladder. Professor Maina Kiongo says his wife, whom they separated and is now deceased, was a government agent. I was under 24 surveillance. There were, there were two cars who were following me from my house. I was staying in uh, Dennis Police Road. I used to work GPO. There were two cars who were following me, that were following me. After I got home, my wife was supposed to take over and give her dossier the following day. So 24 hours on the ladder. <laughs> so that when I went to, when I was arrested, I found uh, a lot of information there. So when I confronted her, that was after I came back from Kisumu. She ran away on 20... 23rd February, 1986. When I came from work, I found he had, she had cleaned the house and gone away. So, that same evening, that evening, I used to, I used to leave work, go home direct. Even when I go to a pub, I will not even drink. 
I knew that I'm being followed. If I sit down with you, you also be, you also be, become marked. So that day when I went home, I, I arrived home. I used to leave office at 4 30. I reached home 5 and to my house. A few minutes later, I heard the bell. I went there to open. I found four gentlemen. I told we are police officers. Want to search your house? So how do I know you are police officers? They were led by senior superintendent Wajau. The government had struggled to hunt down and uproot the movement, but Kiongo's wife single-handedly deflated the unit. The government had already come to know there was a movement. The government was groping in the darkness. So when this piece of information, it was a breakthrough. And uh, it was said, I was a ringleader. By that, that one alone, they had the list of 40 people. Can I tell you, every one of those people ended up in the house. People who are so innocent, because they were not members of Mwakenya, they were my friends. And here was a noble cause. You contact your friends. Quite a number of them were members, but the majority were not. They ended up there. Some of them were ended up, uh, quite a number of them were ended up in the committee. As I said, they up being fined. Something that really affected me because they were innocent. For me, I was not innocent in the sense that I was involved with those, those things. On the night of February 23rd, 1986, the government swung into action. An elaborate crackdown was conducted that netted all the six main pillars of the Mwakenya movement except one. The regime knew that it was not sitting uh, pretty in terms of uh, its popularity. And so uh, we were busted. How? I think they know better how they busted. But I remember when I was in Nyayo House uh, being shown photographs uh, of myself walking in the streets, you know, by the police. Uh, and uh, meaning that they had been on my radar for quite some time. And in one night, uh, when they decided that it was now time to act, of course, the first person to be arrested was Peter Yankehara, who was arrested somewhere in February. And he was in Nyayo. We got the wind uh, that he had been arrested. Now, so uh, we pulled up our antennas, you know, and um, our time came. And in one night, they wanted to make a clean sweep uh, of um, six people. There was Gadito, Karaoke, there was uh, Professor Ngodo, there was Maina Kiongo, there was Gekanga, who is uh, a refugee in Sweden today. And I think there were a number of others. So they thought that in one night, you know, they would collect all of us. That I think was on 12th. March 1986. Uh, so I happened to have been out on teaching practice in Machakos uh, when they zoomed in in my house at uh, midnight. They found my wife and children, woke them up. They were not lucky to find me. All the suspects nabbed ended up in Nyayo House for grilling on why they were engaging in what was considered illegal and clandestine activities since Kenya was a one-party state by law. You are taken around all over the places. Then you are taken to the basement of Nyayo House. Nyayo House would be put naked in a, a, a water uh, in a water-clogged cell. You will stay there. You come, they are called you. They pick you up to... 26th floor. So a lot of beatings, threats, uh, threats of uh, elimination, 
I remember one time Opio, who was the, the master uh, interrogator, came and uh, started, um, uh, he came actually with two small pistols. You know, I hadn't even seen uh, such small pistols. And he started uh, plugging in the, the bullets and was telling me, you know, uh, it's very easy, you know, to just get rid of you and um, forget about the story. And uh, there were people like Koyugi, who was then, I think, an in it was a PS or something like that, internal, uh, Minister of Internal Affairs. Uh, who came with his threats and I knew this was now the political angle to uh, the whole interrogation. And uh, they would even bring, I remember one time Kyongo was brought uh, uh, to me, stark naked, completely naked. And uh, all kinds of threats, you know, and being played off uh, each other. I actually told them all, everything. I told them I, w I wanted even to purchase a machine gun in Uganda, you know? I told them that I even went to, 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 to Uganda. I, even, I went to the Cuban embassy. I, 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 I wanted to, to get um, assistance from the government of Cuba. I even tried to go to the North Korean embassy in, in Uganda, because there were, there were no embassies here. Because I knew, they, I knew they knew these things. I knew they knew. Because we had... Uh, I was not going there. In Uganda, it was not secret. So I would tell them everything that I knew, they also knew. So they could not get a, a good reason to, 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 to torture us. All the suspects were charged and thrown into detention, but the punitive act never served as a deterrent. It was a luta continua. When we got there, first of all, because we knew that... Um, we were not criminals, but we were political prisoners. So that gave us, uh, you know, the spirit to live on and even continued with our political activities there in terms of uh, having cells, you know, discussing political, uh, uh, you know, the politics, even went on to uh, actually recruit other political prisoners into uh, prison cells. This is where we found uh, Maina Kenyati and many other places. Of course, the Kariukis who are of the Air Force, the Imanyaras, you know, and the rest. So we actually became a, com a political community. And it's like, it was now like uh, normal life once again. We were scattered to the four directions of the wind, you know, and we were taken, some people were taken to Shimolatewa, Kengongo, uh, all the prisons uh, in Kenya, I, I was taken to uh, Kibos with uh, Mondawiro, uh, Mganga. Manje's lowest moment was when he was moved from Kibos prison to Nairobi as his states. I was uh, called for uh, my appeal now in the high court. And I was to be transported back to Nairobi from Kibos. There was no police van, so uh, they had to use uh, public uh, means. So I was to be transported in a bus. So uh, when you are being transported, uh, when you are being moved from one cell, um, one prison to the other, you have your shirts, you know, the ones that you came in with. You know, you are property, you are uh, earthly possessions. So they are put in a small bag. Uh, for you to carry. I was handicapped as a prisoner. Uh, of course, that's a standard treatment. But what I thought was not very frightening, but, you know, I don't know how, what words I can say. They tied a chain to the handicaps, something like um, uh, two meters, two, three meters. And this is what the Askari was holding on. In 1988, nine of them were driven from prison to State House and were released by President Daniel Moy. There was Raira, 
the Ozagina, the Ozamina, there was the Pade, I was there, and Mukangi. So we were six detainees of the Severians. But there were three others who had been detained under the coup who were in the military. So when it was announced nine detainees and there are no more detainees, we had left Mokarunganga, Wanyere Kehoro, and Mamiroge Karioki. Yeah, those three had been left. We were told to carry our clothes one morning, Pang Alej, and Miroge predicted, said, you people are going to be released. So we went to the state house for the first time, because we had not been there before. We met the president. We were given some tea, but we were hesitant to take tea because we didn't know whether the system wants to poison us and we die. So he came, he addressed us, and he said he has nothing to do with our arrests or our jailing, and he was now complaining to people like Lonzo and the other guy who was in charge of prison, telling them, you people are spoiling my name. Why do you arrest them? Right. Then he said, I want to release you, and I want you to go and do work. Me and Mukagi told him we were at the University of Nairobi and we think we have been dismissed. He said, he ordered that everybody should go back to where he had come from. But when we came out, it was not going to be because Busy, who was the vice chancellor, refused to address that and we didn't mind. That's when now we moved on to struggle with the others, Matibas, the beers who had come for the second uh, for the multi party system. December 1991 marked the climax of the Second Liberation when Kanu regime repealed Section 2A of the Constitution, ushering in a new dawn of multi party democracy. <laughs> Duncan Haimba for KTN.